Bryce Norton, Britain's largest military airbase. 8,000 men and women serve and live in a thriving community the size of a small town. It operates 24 hours a day with seven flying squadrons, two parachute units, Heart rate's going now. A world-class aeromedical evacuation unit. This is our number one priority, get this guy home. And an airport that dispatches and receives thousands of troops back home from war zones. I'm so excited, I wanted to cry. The most seasoned professionals rub shoulders with the newest recruits. Train hard, fight easy. Done correctly, it's a work of art. But it's more than just a military base. Supporting operations in Afghanistan, hosting traditional historic celebrations to the saddest of all occasions. Everything stops for the repatriation to take effect. Inside RAF Bryce Norton. In this episode, the high-octane adventure of training for elite military action. Once they cross that line, it's out of your hands. You rely on them as individuals to do their job properly and the stark reminder that servicemen and women can and do pay the ultimate price for their country. Death is a reality, unfortunately. It's really important that we deal with it in, in the most dignified and appropriate uh, way possible. Life behind the wire at RAF Bryce and Orton has more than its fair shares of highs and lows that are unique to life in the military. For many, it's the thrill of performing a difficult job under challenging conditions that makes it all worthwhile. Meet Marine and Mountain leader Pete Curley, a man who's spent 23 years taking calculated risks with danger. A seasoned pro, he's based at JADTU, a tough tri-service testing and training unit specialising in air delivery. He's an expert on how to drop battle-ready troops onto rugged terrains, cliffs and into the sea, commando style. On this course, he teaches these skills to servicemen who'll then go on to train up more troops for the front line. They are treated harshly, uh, but fairly, and they're pushed to their absolute limits. Get it on! Get it on! Get it on! Don't give up! The guys are pushed hard in training, so when they go out, onto the ground, they're, pu they're pushed hard because that's the way, that's the nature of war, unfortunately. It's, uh, it's an old saying we have, train hard, fight easy. Afghan is not the kind of place where you fight easy, you still fight hard. This 40-foot platform simulates the height trainees will have to speed out of a helicopter and survive. Let's try and uh, keep our legs off the rope, let's try and get ourselves out properly and rotating down so we make that clean exit. Right, guys? These techniques are based on World War II rope practices. It's still the quickest way to get kitted up troops onto the ground in places too dangerous for a helicopter to touch down. The whole point of fast roping is to get the guys on the ground quickly, so safety is paramount all the time. It's so important because it's so easy for people to... Uh, a mistake only has to happen once, and there's catastrophic, you know, consequences. Roger, cleared the dispatch First guy out, it's halfway. Faster and more dangerous than abseiling, troops can be on the ground in just a few seconds. Broken ankles and friction burns are an occupational hazard, and a bad landing could end in a broken back. Guys can quite easily fall down a cliff. They can quite easily um, cause injury to other people because if a cliff gives way, for instance, or something like that. So there's a lot of pitfalls to just get into the target. The RAF Bryce Norton, where JAD2 is based, is the main place in the country where wannabe specialist instructors can learn the ropes. The right kind of people are the people who've got the right frame of mind, really. And guys have to be, rather than being particularly fit, massively fit, uh, a triathlon runner or something like that, they have to be robust. Pete thrives on the high stakes and high adrenaline nature of his job. In some jobs, people go to work and they get stressed out because they've got to get a report in at the end of that week or something. Every time I go to work, I hope someone doesn't die, you know, or gets crippled or something. The only time I ever get out of me pram about anything is safety. Get it on! Get it on! Get it on! See what you did there? You changed hands there, didn't you? You did. I'm telling you, you did. Letting go of that rope, that is a massive no-no. 
that the last one, is it? The change in commitments of Britain's armed forces has had a big impact on the men he's been teaching. Good, 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 good. In the last 10 years, it's just gone mental. People have come in and moan about being on training teams. And I'd say to them, just be careful what you wish for. Two or three years later, every man and his dog's been to Afghan. Everyone's been under fire. Everyone's done the they joined up to do. Pete isn't just talking about the troops and full-time service. He means the Territorial Army and reservists too. The TA, for instance, they've come into their own. The reservists, you know, they used to join up, weekend warriors, have a bit of a play when they fancied. Now, some of those guys have done two or three tours, six-month tours with units. So it's, it's big, it's big commitment. Do not think if you trickle out of the door nice and slowly, I'll take pity on you. It'll just take you longer to get to the ground to have to run back up again. Why it annoys me when, when civvies protest about our soldiers. You know, it's all right for them to stand in Trafalgar Square gobbing off, but safe enough there, isn't it? Let's face it. Once Pete's training instructors have proven they have the basic skills, the final test of the day is to wind up the drop rope ready to load onto the helicopter. You ain't gonna break it, Tone. Keep hold of the end. Keep hold of the end. But for one trainee, that's easier said than done. <laughs> Day one of the course has ended with a laugh. But soon they'll be fast roping out of a helicopter under Pete's beady eye, where the stakes will be a whole lot higher. That's it. Bryce Norton is also famous for another of the RAF specialist training units the legendary number one parachute training school. Here, every year, hundreds of service personnel pass through its doors and jump out of its aircraft. Get tight, then. Stay tight, get your feet underneath you. Turn them off. Today, the school is playing host to 45 soldiers who are taking their penultimate jump before earning their wings as fully-fledged paratroopers. Under the guidance of Sergeant Dave Hughes, some of them have taken years to rack up the five jumps needed to qualify. It's very prestigious, um, the wings for the guys. For them, that's, that's, that's more important. It's the old uh, kudos, I think, for want of a word, uh, that they have to have these wings uh, put on them. It is quite an honour. When you see that, you're part of an airborne brethren. And anyone who's earned their wings will receive a welcome boost to their salary. So I think it's about £5.75 a day for them. Uh, you know, and if you look at that, what adds up over the year and everything else like that, you know, when they go into these units, it's quite a lot of money, really. So the money's a bonus, I think, for these guys. It is the kudos of actually having that and the maroon berry with the Pegasus. <laughs> Today's trainees are a mixture of regular soldiers and reservists from the Territorial Army, civilians who serve as volunteer soldiers in their spare time. Uh, my name's Matthew Williams. I'm a painter and decorator. Yeah, yeah, so I'm used to heights. <laughs> Uh, take it's took you what three best part of three years on it. Yeah, to, from from passing people and some wings. Yeah. Just checking that all the kits are right. That it's it's going to open. Hopefully, when we uh, jump out. I guess fine games for me. Before they jump out for real, Dave and his team of PJIs, parachute jump instructors, put the trainee paras through a series of drills to make sure they're ready for anything. It's not a natural thing to do to throw yourself out of a serviceable aircraft. So we need to prepare these guys to react instinctively to any potential um, mistake in, in his drills. What you can see basically now is these guys are doing all the drills they kept for emergencies. So if they get twists, so they come out of the canopy and they start spinning around, they have to learn how to, how to get out of those twists and kick out before they actually hit the ground. Another one is as well, if they have a malfunction on their canopy, they need to pull their reserve very, very quickly and then act, react instinctively. Uh, to the malformed canopy by operating their reserve and then carrying out the drills correctly so they hit the ground right, and they're staying nice and tight. All the drills here have to be bang, bang, bang. Your sense of urgency needs to be there. But it isn't just the trainee paratroopers feeling the pressure. Dave is also assessing the performance of his PJIs, including Corporal Becky Hill. I am the only female PGI at the moment. Um, hopefully a few more will come through. A lot of girls get put off by it because it is hard work, you know, it is, you're expected to carry exactly the same kit as all the lads do when you jump, you know, you're expected to do everything exactly the same. And obviously it's all male environment and I think in the past that's put a few girls off. Yes, yeah, right. Becky's doing really, really well. She competes very well with the voice. And being a female voice at a higher pitch, she does stand out a little bit more. Great position. 
All the lads at work sort of say, oh, Becky, she's one of the lads. And I think that's the attitude that you've got to have if you go down there, you know. You're not going to get on if you flutter your eyelids and stick your chest out. That's not going to work, you know. You just need to muck in, show that, you, you know, that you're willing to do everything. You have to be a little bit thick-skinned to begin with, but then once they get to know you and know your personality and know what you like, then, yeah, it's fine. I enjoy it. And with the training drills completed, the trainees know their next stop is 700 feet above them. Next, trainees take the next stage of their hardcore fast roping instructors course. Get your legs off the rope! Like this! It's not hard. It's not rocket science, as they say. OK, but if it's not done right, you'll kill yourself. And wannabe paras make a daring low-level jump to get their wings. Monday at 10 on Sky One HD. At Bryce Norton's Parachute Training School, 45 wannabe paratroopers are about to make an important training jump. And the instructors are making their final checks on the chutes. But it's not just the parachutes that need checking. So does the trainees' weight. 116. Uh, kilograms is the cutoff uh, weight for the guys. If they weigh over 116 kilograms, they can't jump. And it's all to do with the cable or the weight on the cable. If you get 45 uh, paratroopers on, you know, going out of each door, that's a lot of pressure being put on that cable. So we have to have a limit of what weight they need to be. Stand with your reserve in your left hand so that we know that you're ready to be checked. Helmet should be on. The trainees pair up to check that each other's chutes are properly fitted. Yeah, the buddy-buddy system basically is you, you put your parachute on and you get the person next to you to make sure that you've not left, like, a chest strap loose or, you know, like, comfy pads and things like that we have on there. And then it's just a buddy-buddy check, a confidence, really. It's like a reassurance check that they've done everything right. This is then double-checked by the instructors. Despite the hours of training, there's always one who hasn't done it properly. he got all his kit caught up and everything, you know. He'll admit it himself, he's... He's gone red now. He looks like a swan vester. <laughs> <laughs> he got all his kit messed up. And everything. I think he said he was in a bit of a rush, but you can't rush these things, obviously, in all seriousness. He's, uh, that's why we do our checks as well as the buddy-buddy checks, to make sure that they're right before they jump out of the aircraft. <laughs> However, as checks, we, might, well, we could have been here all day with him, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Leave it being an absolute numpty, innit? Yeah. There you go, look at that. <laughs> Fully kitted up, the trainees board the aircraft to make their challenging low-level jump. They're now only 700 feet above Oxfordshire and approaching the moment of no return. This is the lowest jump they've attempted in their training so far. The lower you jump from, the less time you have to react and prepare for landing. These troops will hit the ground just 30 seconds after leaving the aircraft. Although they've all made at least three jumps already, this is their toughest yet. Having been there myself, when I first did my parachute jump and... I was stood in the door, I was the number one in the door. And I look back and there's 19-year-olds, 18-year-olds there, and I'm looking at them, what on earth in my right mind am I doing here on Hercules? In order to safely clear the aircraft's slipstream, the trainees have to launch themselves at least two feet clear when they jump. The troopers will be jumping out of both sides of the aircraft in groups of four to six, which the paras call sticks. Dave and his team will be helping them on their way. From the aircraft, the first jump looked to be textbook, but word comes through that there's been an accident on the ground. The lad's winded himself, he's got a bit of a head injury, so they're just checking him out. So we're on hold, once we get the old clear, we'll start parachuting again. We've seen things like broken legs, like compound fractures on the shins, and the unfortunate one that comes into the ground a little bit harder, you know, you can get neck injuries. Nine times out of ten, if they're injured, it's because they've done something wrong themselves, really. You can't rely on human factor. You can give them the best training you can, it's down to that individual. It's like a, a football manager. 
He can give all the training he wants and the coaches give him all the best training they want. Once they cross that line there on the pitch, it's out of your hands. You rely on them as individuals to do their job properly. As well as the weight, the troops have to deal with turbulence caused by flying at such a low altitude. But eventually, the second sticks are given the green light. It's not Dave's lucky day. Once again, there's been a problem with the landing. Another injury. So that means more delays for the last stick and more turbulence to deal with. For one soldier in particular, it's all a bit much. Not that he's been given much sympathy from the instructors. Eventually, Private Fish and the rest of his stick are put out of their misery and out of the aircraft. Now Dave can relax after an exercise that's been anything but routine. Very frustrating when you feel like... You know, a simple sortie, obviously, a couple of injuries, just delays everything, you know, it's just, it is frustrating, but it's part, part, part of the job, really. Once Dave and the team return to Bryes, they check up on the progress of the injured men. Yeah, the guys uh, obviously been past fit, they're OK. The doctor had a look at the uh, guy with the, um, uh, the neck injury and apparently, quote unquote, uh, dry your eyes and get on with it, there's nothing wrong with you. So he's back tonight, thank God, so luckily he can graduate, hopefully. And what about Joe Fish, the puking para? Oh, my life. See, that, that usually has a knock-on effect when you're doing low-level parachuting. Because there's no horizon to look at, the guys tend to feel sick because the aircraft is doing what's called escape and evasion. It's throwing itself all over the place and they've got to stay in formation. Um, and obviously, with that drone and everything that goes around, obviously, the guy was feeling quite wheezy. He threw up everywhere. I've never seen it. It was just like a scene from The Exorcist or something like that. It was absolutely awful. Once we took off, started getting the turbulence in quite bad and then that was just me, gone, just throwing up everywhere. It took me about half an hour to get a sick bag, so the floor wasn't looking too good either. Over on the east side of the base at RAF Bryes Norton is JAD2, the specialist training unit that devises ways to drop battle-ready troops into places too dangerous for a helicopter to land. It's day two of the fast roping instructor's training course. Experienced Marine Pete Curley is teaching his trainees the ropes. So what your goggles down when you're on, when you're going on, all right? It's a very dangerous activity, um, but that's why we train guys the way we do. It's not hard, it's not rocket science, as they say, OK, but if it's not done right, you'll kill yourself. But these kind of rapid 30-second deployments can make all the difference in highly sensitive missions. This technique is being used all around the world. I've used it in uh, Sierra Leone in the past. The Royal Navy use it all the time to board pirate ships in the Gulf, um, and it's used in Afghanistan as well. And as you know, they got old uh, Bin Laden by, you by the guys fast roping into the area. It's this kind of extreme challenge that attracts people like Pete to a career in the military. When you go on operations, it's particularly hard, frightening sometimes. But when you come back, it's eminently fulfilling to know that you've gone out, done your job to the best of your ability, and you've come back safely. Well, the first time I did it, it was a long time ago, and a bit of a young spunker, really. Don't really think about, the f there's no real fear when you're young, and you just do as you're told. Which, which is good in a way, because from my point of view now, I'm in right at the top of the tree when it comes to roping. Um, I like to think that when I send someone out of a door, they, they'll confidently go because they know what I'm teaching them is, is safe. Because it's planned, all as much information is sought from various sources, uh, record reports, photographs, satellite imagery, other patrols that guys and people have seen. And with that information in the back of their mind, they know when they go going down the rope, they've got as much information as they can and work with that. So they're going to try and avoid going down when there's uh, people shooting at them. 
although that can happen, but fast rope is a capability that's designed for that kind of thing in the extreme cases. Plus, of course, you've got everybody else you know. Once you leave a helicopter, you've got four, five, six, 20 other blokes coming down that's going to support you, help you, uh, and do as good a job as you're doing, probably better in some cases. Pete's expertise is rubbing off on his trainees, and they're ready to move on to the final test of the day, carrying kit and weapons, combat style. When you go to Afghanistan, you know, people shoot at you, you shoot back at them. It's pretty hairy sometimes. Everyone's scared. People say they're not scared, they're lying. But fear, is, fear can be good if it's channeled and directed. And uh, we like to give people the knowledge to overcome that fear. Uh, a, a saying that we, we use in the Marines, knowledge dispels fear. I think it's good that guys are willing to get on that plane and go out there and do what they've got to do for the country. If you were sat in an office in Civvy Street, not that I'd ever work in an office, but if you were sat in an office somewhere like that and you said something, you'd be up on a charge for being rude to someone. But to us, it's a laugh, because no one really means anything by it, um, and we're not afraid to say what we think. So what, your legs are like this? All the time. Uh, pirouetting, yeah. Do a ballet dancer or something. I used to be. Ali saves lives, <laughs> does it? <laughs> <laughs> After two days' intensive training, Pete's handing out certificates for the course. Everyone has passed. While these trainees have long military careers ahead of them, Pete has just three months before he hangs up his boots. McDougal. Well now, Mac. Good man. You're too tall for that bloody small links, aren't you? Recently, he's been reflecting upon the highs and lows of his own career. What am I saying? I've come to the end of my time now. I'll have done 23 years when I leave. It's just time to move on, really. I'm getting on a bit. Um, it's a young man's game, to be fair. Um, I've had a good time. I want to leave on a high. Uh, there are downsides to it, um, but they are overshadowed by the, uh, the ups of the last 23 years. One of the things I will miss is just the laughing and joking. Uh, that's something you won't see anywhere else because people, um, people are easily offended, people don't understand, people think you're being serious when we know for a fact it's all banter, it's all about not taking life too seriously, because if you did that, you'd go mad. Pete is now looking for a new career on the other side of the wire that will fit his adventurous personality. My main aim, long term, is to do knowledge, uh, to be a, uh, a cabbie in London. When I've earned enough money, I can then go mountaineering, I can go skiing, I can go walking in the mountains of Wales or Scotland, you know, I take my family out. Um, I'll still be, I'll, you know, uh, I might be getting on a bit, but I'm young at heart, and uh, you know, my kids keep me young, and they'll be out on the mountains and the hills, whether they like it or not. Next, staff at RAF Bryce Norton pull together to get ready for a repatriation ceremony. The ceremony itself, it's it's usually about 15 minutes long. It's needed for the grieving process. It's, it's a big part of it, and it's. Uh, it's the military's way of recognising and appreciating the position that we're putting everyone that we send out to theatre. Life in the military offers plenty of highs with the challenges of an action and adventure lifestyle. But with it also come the lows, and none worse than when a soldier is killed in action. The soldier died when his vehicle was struck by an improvised explosive device in Palmond province. His family has been informed. Since 2011, Bryce Norton has been home to all repatriations of fallen soldiers returning to the UK. They are codenamed Operation Pabe and follow a highly structured drill. It's the day before the repatriation of two soldiers killed in Afghanistan. Out in front of the repatriation centre, the pallbearers, who are friends and colleagues of the deceased, have volunteered from their respective regiments and are at Bryce Norton to rehearse their role in the ceremony. Bryce's station warrant officer's job is to make sure they have everything they need for the ceremony to run smoothly. 
In order to give the uh, bearer parties the best opportunity for tomorrow, the ramp that you can see behind me, the yellow contraption, was made locally at Bryce Norton. It's to re replicate the same size ramp, heights, etc. So they get a feel for the angles they're going to be walking on or marching on and marching off at with the aircraft. The formal ceremony expresses the nation's recognition and appreciation for the family's loss. Through military fashion, we need to have slick drills because it's in the full view of the families and of the senior military representatives. We want to get it right. Joe Rowe is a repatriation manager whose job it is to look after the families on the day of the ceremony. I volunteered for this pretty much as soon as I arrived at Bison Norton. I felt it was the right thing to do. Um, it, it's important. This is probably the single most important thing that we do um, at Bryce Norton, and it's important that it's done right. Um, I think it's about putting something back, um, supporting your colleagues, um, regardless of their service. It's early morning on the day of the ceremony, and the final preparations at the repatriation centre are put in place. Everything needs to be fine-tuned to make sure that uh, everything in the building is perfect for when the family arrive, and that's pretty much my job on the day. The ceremony itself, it's, it's usually about 15 minutes long. It's needed for the grieving process. It's a big part of it, and it's, uh, it's the military's way of recognising uh, and appreciating the position that we're putting everyone that we send out to theatre. Joe drops in to give the building the all clear. So what I'm doing now is just giving the room a final check before the families arrive to make sure it's all in order. Um, I think we've got prayer cards still to go, but the Padres will be bringing those once they've sorted those out. Death is a reality, unfortunately. Um, so we, it's really important that we deal with it in, in the most dignified and appropriate uh, way possible. Um, there, but for the grace of God, it, you know, it could be my mum and my family sitting there today. Um, so it's very easy to empathise with the families and you really do want to make sure that everything is done um, in the best possible way. Outside, the funeral directors prepare their cars for their part in the ceremony. We've had this particular contract for over 12 years and certainly in the last eight, it's been a frequent practice. It was Rupert Brooks, wasn't it, wrote in the First World War, how fearful it is to die abroad in his poem. And I think we have to bear that in mind and know that we're bringing the sons and daughters home here to their families, and that's uh, a duty of care that we must have. The bodies will be arriving directly from the mortuary at Camp Bastion in Afghanistan, known as Rose Cottage. I got my Afghanistan tour medal because I've been out there for over, I believe it's 45 consecutive days, and it was a great honour and a privilege to receive that for the work I do. Not that we'd want it, but it's always great satisfaction to have a medal. Joe will meet the families before the ceremony to discuss the running order and any other concerns they may have. Quite often at that stage that they're um, confused or angry or not understanding what's happened, or they, and they very often have a lot of questions, not necessarily questions that we can answer, but wider political questions. I think that's normal if somebody close to you dies that you, you, and they die young, um, that you question why, you know, and what, what was it worth it, you know, what was, what was the justification, um, because you feel absolutely bereft. As the hour of the ceremony approaches, the whole base is put on alert. Between 13.15 hours and 13.40 hours local, there will be a total ban of all airside vehicle and aircraft movements for the duration of the approach and landing of the repatriation aircraft. Everything just comes to a halt for a, a given period of time in order that silence or, or quietness can be given um, for the repatriation ceremony. Um, and so everybody who is involved in station life will know when that time is, is going to be and invariably will also hear the aircraft coming into land. With perfect military precision, the C-17 will touch down at exactly 1.30 p.m. When we all go outside to watch the aircraft land, um, that's particularly emotional for everyone because that's actually their loved one. Really coming home once the aircraft's touched down, um, it, it becomes very real then. The, the shock of the whole um, loss becomes a natural reality. And then they're starting to have to deal with it, I guess.
as soon as you see it, you have a lump in the throat and you, you know, just the emotions that the family are going through at that particular time, you can't help but be affected yourself. The pallbearers, family members and staff gathered for the occasion wait for the C-17 to be prepared for the ceremony. An hour later, it taxis to the repatriation centre. Everyone takes up their well-rehearsed positions in anticipation for the ceremony to begin. When the, the bugle sounds the last post, um, you recognise the loss involved and the grief that the individuals, that the families that you're stood next to are experiencing. Um, and obviously, whilst we perhaps do our best to try and perhaps control our own emotions, obviously they're experiencing emotions which are far greater than we are. Um, but certainly for when those coffins are brought off the back of the aircraft, for me, um, that's a, a very poignant time. After the ceremony, the families leave the base with a funeral cortege and pass by the memorial garden in the local town of Carterton, where more family, friends and local residents have assembled to pay their respects. You cannot help but reflect on what your day is as involved. Just to be able to jump from work, out of the work car and into the house and just crack on with normal life is, you can't do that. There's a transition process you've got to go through in order to get back into reality. Um, and when you look upon your own family at home, it just brings the significance of everything that you've gone through that day um, into a stark reality. One of the really difficult parts is when the families thank you, because um, it's incredibly humbling. There's nothing we can do to make their situation better in terms of bringing their loved one back, which is all they want. So when they thank you for just being there and handing them cups of tea or passing them a tissue or something, I do find that um, incredibly emotional, actually, um, because they're so lovely to do that. In the midst of all their utter grief and misery and their darkest days of their lives, they are able to find the, the courage and the dignity um, to say thank you to people in, in that sort of situation it is to me um, amazing. Next, paras from RAF Bryce Norton take part in a mass training exercise to commemorate one of the largest airborne assaults in history. And we lost 194 aircrew altogether before they decided abandon the, the exercise. And one paratrooper jumps carrying a very special package. All of a sudden you think, actually, I'm going to hit the ground in a minute. Quite a proud moment to be able to do something for people. Army Unit 47 Air Dispatch are based at RAF Bryce Norton. They're the military's delivery boys, tasked with dropping supplies to troops in hotspot locations all over the world. The bleakest hour in the squadron's nearly 100-year history was the Battle for Arnhem during World War II in September 1944, infamous as one of the largest airborne assaults in history. The unit sustained terrible losses while dropping supplies to Allied troops under heavy German bombardment. What we didn't know was that on the Monday night, the Germans had brought all the anti-aircraft guns and SP guns, and as our aircraft came in, so they knocked them out of the sky. 
and uh, they shot down any number in flames, including the second aircraft to be shot down with my aeroplane. So I would have died if I'd have been with them because I'd have had no parachute, right? Because the lads on the ground were so dependent on supplies, our lads still flew for the next four days, knowing full well they were going to die, and we lost 194 aircrew altogether before they decided to abandon the, the exercise. Guy once wrote something about leasing the Dakota going down on fire and a lad in the door still dispatching the parcels even though the plane was in flames and going down and he was all about to die. And I think that, that's a testament for a, a lot of soldiers, really, of how they have that way of thinking. Every year, a commemorative service is held in Arnhem to remember the fallen troops and the sacrifices they made for their country. The highlight of the memorial is a huge parachute drop, featuring nearly a 1,000 paratroopers from all over the world. 47 AD will be represented in this year's drop by Sergeant Major Calvin Venn, who will be making a very special jump. He'll be carrying the ashes of Frank Vandenberg, a Dutchman who devoted his life to looking after a memorial dedicated to 47 AD in Arnhem. Yeah, Frank had, he had, had this um, wish that he wanted them to be um, parachuted out or sprinkled over the DZ um, from, the, from an aircraft. You know, I met, I met Frank quite a lot, um, quite a few occasions, and he had done such sterling work for air dispatchers and other British units um, that, uh, yeah, obviously, it, it did mean quite a bit, yeah. Arnhem was one of the major battles at the end of World War II. British forces were ordered to seize and hold German bridges deep behind enemy lines. The battle for the bridge at Arnhem was immortalised in the classic war movie, A Bridge Too Far. At Eindhoven Airport, it's an early start for Calvin and his fellow paratroopers, taking part in today's commemorative jump. But this is more than just a memorial to remember the fallen troops. It's a massive training exercise, known as a battle camp for elite paratroopers from all over the world. All the nations pretty much get together. They can um, then swap any differences on uh, parachuting, things like that, um, ideas and that sort of thing. Um, and they're able to gain knowledge from uh, different nations. Calvin's keen to represent his unit, 47 Air Dispatch. But his parachuting skills are a bit rusty. Bar a recent one-day refresher course, he hasn't jumped in six years. I trained a parachute jump um, about, I can't remember, it's quite a long time ago, actually. It was lucky here on Bryce Norton, the um, aerial delivery wing is situated here as well. And I'd do a parachute jump here from Bryce Norton to uh, get me back in date. And who better than parachute training school chief instructor, Sergeant Dave Hughes, to oversee his jump. Just looking down here now, we've got the Dutch, the Polish, we've got Americans, we've got British, maybe a few Germans. And it's the paratroopers from Poland who have really caught Dave's eye. Nice helmet. Yeah. <laughs> All in for drum. They're brilliant, aren't they? They look like ticks. Calvin has Frank Vanderberg's ashes safely packed in his Bergen, a paratrooper's rucksack. Once he's landed, Calvin will meet with the man's relatives and present the ashes to them. Oh, well, it's good, isn't it? It's first for me. Dispatch with somebody who's got ashes, it's amazing. As the paratroopers take to the skies in Eindhoven, 90 miles away in Arnhem, crowds are gathering to watch the jump. Commemorating the battle and the soldiers who lost their lives is a big deal for the 140,000 people who live here. It's also a chance for the people from Bryce Norton to reflect on the value of life in the military. And you hear the locals talking to you, you know. And um, one of the guys came up to me and he said, we'd like to thank you for liberating Arnhem. Uh, and used to be, and I thought, well, thank you, but I wasn't even born then. But however, thank he said, no, you Brit we love the British, we love the British military, you gave us our lives back, and uh, we can never, ever begin to repay you what you've done for us. But for Dave, all of his concentration now has to go on the safe dispatching of all the troops on his aircraft, a challenge he thrives on. 
I, I just love it because it means something to me, you know. And you've got the Americans there, the Brits there, the Belgians there, the French, Canadians, you've got the Polish, even the Germans were there, believe it or not. And to come together, talk together, and produce a sortie to drop all these paratroopers in there, phenomenal. Of the thousand paratroopers making the memorial jump today, Dave is dispatching 70 of them, one of whom is Calvin Venn. So uh, the next step is obviously open the doors, two minutes out, getting the guys in the door at one minute, and then uh, throwing them out. Sorry, dispatching them. That's what I meant to say, dispatching them. Dave's looked after hundreds of similar drops in his career, but Arnhem is a particularly tricky one, as there is a motorway at one end of the drop zone. He has to get 15 paratroopers out in under 15 seconds, or they'll have much more than a bumpy landing. And they don't have any choice in the matter. Because you are paratrained, if you don't jump, you can have disappearing action taken against you. Once you're paratrained, it's, your, it's then your job. It's then a capability that the Army require you to do. So, um, yeah, they give you a quick brief to ensure that uh, you, you understand that. After 10 minutes circling, they approach the drop zone. Action! Action! Station! And then it's time to go. Calvin and the Ashes are out safely. It's, it's quite a funny feeling, the fact that actually you just want to enjoy the, uh, the experience and you want to have a look around. And even though Dave himself hasn't jumped, he's thrilled by the experience. Boom! Got it! All of a sudden, you think, actually, I'm going to hit the ground in a minute. Um, so you have to start thinking about other things and rather enjoying yourself. It was lucky the weather was quite good. Uh, it wasn't too bad. Um, ground's pretty bumpy over there, but uh, came down pretty, pretty successfully. Woo! A little quick now, isn't it? Good job nobody was shooting us. Dave's aircraft load have all had a good and injury-free landing. In fact, the only person who has been injured is the dispatcher himself. The guy went into me and he just my thumb went straight back and bent onto my wrist. I was like, the yank. And Calvin has located the family of the man whose ashes he's been carrying. It's an emotional end to a busy day. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, it's quite a special feeling, because you, like I say, you're doing it for a, for a reason. Um, and then it was quite, um, yeah, it's quite a proud moment, actually, to be able to do something for people that meant so much. You need to know your history, where you've come from, where you've evolved to today. And I think that's important, and it does hold a special place for me. I'll never, ever forget being involved with Arnhem, really. It is, it's brilliant. Love and other pharmaceutical drugs make the Young Doctor's Notebook a dark, compelling read here next tonight over on Sky Ops.